in the spring of 285. The Emperor Diocletian had taken control of the entire Roman Empire by defeating the Emperor Carinus in the Battle of Margus. His victory marked the beginning of a new era for Rome, for his long reign allowed him to make some of the most substantial changes to the Imperium. The responsibilities he had taken over were considerable, and the challenges he faced were numerous. Over the course of his rule, Diocletian had elevated some of his generals to the rank of emperors until the empire became a tetrarchy. Due to the fragmentary nature of our sources and the enormity of tasks undertaken by Diocletian and his fellow tetrarchs, it is difficult to write a complete and accurate narrative of this period. Fortunately, the Romans, with their love of history, had left behind many accounts of the emperors. Works written by 4th century historians like Aurelius Victor, Festus, and Atropius had left behind a general history of the empire which touched upon this era. These men were a few generations removed from the events of the Tetrarchy, but the similarities of the accounts led the modern historian Alexander Inman to suspect that their narratives had derived from the same sources that had been lost to us, sources that may have been written by men who lived closer to the time period. We do have a few surviving contemporary works made by Christian writers like Lactantius and Eusebius. The accounts by Lactantius in his book De Mortibus Persecutorum are useful for he had worked in Diocletian's court for an year and had connections with people who worked with the emperors. However, his overt hatred of the pagan emperors, especially of Galerius, had brought about an unbalanced views of the emperors, so his accounts are usually taken with caution by many historians. As for Eusebius, his works on general church history had provided a useful account of the events from his perspective. We also have a collection of panegyrics for the emperors, which were also composed by contemporaries that wrote these speeches to read them out directly to the emperors. However, the purpose of these panegyrics were to boost the image of their patrons, not to give an accurate description of the world. But their contents were based on actual people and events, so they still give a lot of information about this period. Unfortunately, many of the sources do not tell us exactly when some of these events occurred. Because of this, many modern historians are not in agreement on the dates of events and in what order they occurred in. Christian historian Eusebius had made a chronology of Roman history, but it didn't mention all of the events that are relevant to this time period, and some of the dates had been found to be inaccurate. Fortunately, we do have many other archaeological evidence, like coins, monuments, edicts, and proclamations made by the emperors. So modern historians are somewhat able to date some of the events that occurred. With proper logic and reasoning, along with a good amount of knowledge of the Roman mindset and capabilities, modern historians are able to fill in the holes in order to create a reasonable order of events that occurred, which I relied on for the narrative. After Diocletian had defeated Carinus, he went straight to Italy to organize his own administration. He did not travel to Rome to have his powers ratified by the Senate as many other emperors had done. Instead, he traveled to Milan. He allowed most of the administrators who worked under Carinus to continue their duties, which led Aurelius Victor to remark that when Diocletian took over the entire empire, nobody had been executed, disgraced, or stripped of their properties. However, the Roman Empire had suffered a new series of invasions and rebellions which threatened the integrity of the empire. In the north, Frankish pirates were raiding the coast of Gaul and Britain, and within Gaul itself, some of the locals called the Bagwede had revolted and proclaimed their own imperial leaders named Alianus and Amandus. Their names and positions is all we know about these two, for not much else had been written about them. Over to the east, the tribes at the Danube were stirring up trouble along the borders of the empire, and Rome was still at war with the Sassanids. With problems in one far end of the empire to another, one Roman emperor was not enough to respond to all these emergencies. Therefore, on the 21st of July, 285, in the city of Milan, Diocletian had proclaimed a 34-year-old general named Aurelius Maximianus, otherwise known as Maximian, as Caesar. Much like Diocletian, Maximian was born of an obscure peasant stock from the city of Sirmium. He was poorly educated, often described as being boorish, uncultured, and even cruel. But he was a capable commander who was able to endure the harsh conditions of warfare. 
He was also fiercely loyal to Diocletian, more ready for war than he is for plots and intrigue, which is the kind of man that Diocletian needed. As soon as Maximian was declared Caesar, he was sent to the west while Diocletian handled matters in the east. To stop the Frankish pirates from raiding their shores, he had given a task to a soldier named Aurelius Messius Carousius. Carousius was from a tribe called the Menepi, which resides in the low countries of northern Gaul. Much like Maximian and Diocletian, Carousius was also of low birth and had risen through the ranks to a high military command. Not much is known about his exploits, but the Roman historians did mention that he was an excellent soldier and had earned an extraordinary reputation for his service before being stationed in the city of Kesoricum. As for Maximian, he had defeated the Bagode in a short campaign and had the survivors return to their farms. Panegyrics to Maximian mentioned the clemency he showed to the rebels, for they were only poorly trained farmers who were provoked by some injustice from the preceding era. We don't know what these injustices were, perhaps a lot of it was blamed on the previous Emperor Carinus. Not long after Maximian had dealt with the Bagode, two Germanic armies had invaded Gaul. The larger and more formidable army was composed of troops from the Alamanni and the Burgundians, while the other smaller army was made up of the Hiroli and Tabones. Meanwhile in the west, Carosius had built a fleet and had been successful in dealing with the Frankish raiders along the coast. However, reports were coming in towards Maximium that even though Carosius had captured a lot of Franks, he confiscated their loot to enrich himself instead of sending it over to the imperial government. Enraged by these reports, Maximium ordered Carosius' execution. Carosius, thinking the chopping block would be an ignominious end to his career, chose instead to wear the purple. With the support from the Roman legions in the city of Casoricum, the Franks, and the navy, Carosius declared himself Augustus. We don't have the exact dates as to when Carosius had rebelled or when the Germanic armies had invaded, but they most likely happened during late 285 or early 286, because on the 1st of April 286, Maximian had been elevated by Diocletian to the rank of Augustus. It makes sense for Maximian to be elevated after Carosius' rebellion because it's unlikely that Diocletian had even planned to make Maximian his equal when he announced him Caesar. For many generations, the title Caesar had been designated to men who were either a subordinate or a successor to the main emperor, called Augustus. However, Carousius elevating himself to Augustus had put the two emperors in a very precarious position. When Carousius revolted, he took the fleet with him, so Maximian was now at risk of fighting on two fronts. Not only that, since Carousius had been recognized by some of the troops to be Augustus, he technically outranks Maximian, even though neither Maximian or Diocletian recognized him as such. This creates another risk of Maximian's troops switching sides to Carousius. As for Diocletian, if Carousius had been successfully recognized as Augustus, then that will give other generals or governors an incentive to declare themselves Augustus as well. After all, what would prevent other usurpers from usurping another usurper, which Diocletian is one, if anyone with an army can just become the new Augustus? This would have undermined the authority of the current Augustus, which Diocletian had to prevent whatever possible. While all of this was happening in the West, Diocletian had also been busy on his side of the empire. After he made Maximian Caesar, he proceeded to deal with the Sarmatians that invaded the empire through the Danube River. The many engagements that Diocletian had with the various tribes weren't explained in detail, for we only know about them from his victory titles and cursory mentions in the Panegyrics. After he dealt with the Sarmatians, he tried to restore the provinces that were depopulated during the crisis by making large population transfers from one province to another. Most notably, he populated a province of Thrace with people from Asia. When Diocletian heard that Carousius had rebelled and declared himself Augustus, he went to Maximian and elevated him to Augustus with the most elaborate ceremony as he could possibly make it, so it could appear more official than Carousius. After Maximian became Augustus, he returned north where he was found in Mainz on the 21st of June, 286. It was probably from here he moved to the front lines again to deal with the two invading armies. The panegyric to Maximian had explained that the larger Alemanni Burgundian army had been afflicted by starvation before being captured by Maximian's troops. This army was presumably too powerful for Maximian to attack directly, 
so he was ordered to use some sort of scorched earth strategy against them. As for the Hiroli and Tabonets, Maximian's army had managed to destroy them in battle. Diocletian, on the other hand, was more focused on administering the empire. After all, defending the borders is not the only job for an emperor. In between campaigns, whenever possible, the emperors must also maintain the laws, the administration, and the people of Rome. They do this by responding to requests for advice from governors, judge court cases between individuals and organizations, and answer petitions from Romans who came from all walks of life. While there are other administrators to perform these duties, the emperor was the highest authorities of both the military and the law. So when people's disputes were left unresolved, they often sought out the emperor to have his final say in the matter. Since the Roman Empire was very large and heavily populated, one can imagine the frequency of requests being sent to the emperors amidst all the constant battles and the campaigns they had to deal with. Much of it must have been overwhelming for a militaristic man from an uneducated background like Diocletian. He also had to tackle the reoccurring issues of inflation. The previous emperors had significantly reduced the purity of the silver coins until they had become only a thin layer of silver washed over other metals. The soldiers were probably disappointed that their payments in these coins were near worthless, but Diocletian didn't seem to have tried to restore the silver purity during the first few years of his reign. Instead, in the year 286, Diocletian minted a newer version of the Golden Areas with a high gold purity at the weight of 60 to the pound, or 5.5 grams, probably to satisfy his troops with the occasional donatives. Diocletian spent the rest of the summer administrating from the province of Palestina before going to the city of Nicomedia by the winter. Then, on the 1st of January, 287, Maximian and Diocletian were found together again in Trier to celebrate their election to the Roman Council. Gold medallions were issued to the senior members of the army and administration. Each side of the medallion showed the two men next to each other with the same height and appearance. The words Maximian and Diocletian were engraved on each side, aside for the words Augusti on one side and Council on the other. The medallion symbolizes the equal power shared between the two emperors, and even the panegyrics often describe them as brothers, even though they aren't related. In a world where leaders can potentially betray each other and cause discord, it's important to symbolize the concord between the two men in order to assure the people of peace and stability. Their celebration was cut short by news of a barbarian raid, but according to a panegyric dedicated to Maximian, as soon as the news of a raid arrived, he removed his toga, put on his armor, and sallied forth with his troops to fight against the barbarians. He then came back triumphantly on the same day, showing everyone present that a soldier never neglects his duties to the empire. The rest of 287 had a lot of positive developments for the both of them. Maximian was able to conduct raids against the Germans in their own territory, while Diocletian had secured an advantageous peace treaty with the Sassanid Emperor Baram II. Baram II was still suffering from the rebellions in his empire and was in no position to engage the Romans, so he had given gifts to Diocletian and relinquished his claims to Armenia in exchange for peace, although modern historians were still unsure how much of Armenia was given to Roman control. Anyways, this allowed the Romans to install a leader of their own choosing, Tiridates III, a king that was forced out of Armenia by the Sassanids when he was an infant in the 250s. He finally gained his part of Armenia in 287. Diocletian then used the peace as an opportunity to fortify the town of Caucasium and upgraded the defenses on the frontier of Syria to deter any future attempts by the Sassanids to raid Roman territory. By the spring of 288, Maximian started to make preparations for his campaign against Carousius. This is where a general named Flavius Constantius entered the picture. Constantius was an Illyrian born in the province of Dacia Ripensis. We don't know what his social standing was, but he clearly went to the military for his career. He served with the Emperor Aurelian in his campaigns in Syria, and by the time Diocletian became emperor, Constantius had been governor of Dalmatia. We don't know exactly what Constantius did when Diocletian overthrew Carinus, but he did rise up to the ranks to become part of Maximian's closest entourage. 
We also know that he was in some sort of relationship with a Greek woman named Helena, for she and Constantius were the parents of their son Constantine. We don't know if she was Constantius's wife or concubine. The sources don't seem to agree. But we do know that at some point Constantius had separated from Helena to marry Maximian's daughter Theodora. Later, Roman historians said that Constantius had divorced his wife to marry into Maximian's family upon his promotion to Caesar in the year 293. However, the modern historian Timothy Barnes believed Constantius' marriage to Theodora actually occurred somewhere in the late 280s, before his incessant to Caesar. He made his conclusion based on a quote in one of the panegyrics to Maximian, which said that Maximian had his highest-ranking officer marrying to his family. However, this officer wasn't named. In fact, Constantius' name was not mentioned in Maximian's panegyric at all, but another panegyric dedicated to Constantius so that Constantius had been instrumental in winning victories for Maximian during his campaigns against the Germans. So Timothy deduced that the officer might have been Constantius. Theodora was the only daughter Maximian had of marriageable age at this time, for his other daughter, named Fausta, had been born somewhere near the year 290 after the presentation of the panegyric, so it is a possibility. Now back to the situation at hand, before the two official Augusti could make their move directly against Carousius, they first had to isolate him from his Frankish allies as they would be able to disrupt Maximian's seaborne assault. Fortunately for Maximian, one of the Frankish kings named Genobodes was deposed from power by the other Franks and had approached the Romans to make an alliance with them, of which Maximian accepted. Together, their armies had subdued some of the Frankish tribes that allied with Carousius, so Genobodes could rule over them. His intention then turned to Anamani. For this task, he was given aid by Diocletian. Together, the armies had conducted a joint invasion of Anamani territory from two different directions. Diocletian had attacked them from Raetia, while Maximian attacked them from Roman-controlled Germania. Constantius had also taken part in this campaign. First, Panagiaric had mentioned that he captured a Germanic king that had attempted to ambush him. With the Alemanni stunned from the attacks by the two emperors and the Franks subdued within the same year, Maximian was then able to direct his full attention towards Carousius. On the 21st of April, 289, a Panagiaric had been presented to Maximian during a party in Trier. This Panagiaric mentions many of the events that I have described. After all, it's where we got most of our information from. The panegyric also depicts Carousius as a despotic pirate and it mentions a large and glorious fleet that the Romans had assembled. The writer of the panegyric predicted that Maximian would win a major victory over Carousius. But the panegyric is the only source we have for the fleet, for it had completely disappeared from history. Nothing had been written about Maximian's campaign about Carousius. However, another panegyric, written many years later, mentioned a fleet of ships that had been destroyed by a storm, which might have been Maximian's fleet. Perhaps Carousius had managed to destroy Maximian's fleet, and the contemporary writers were too embarrassed to mention it. The only thing we know is that later Roman historians mentioned that Carousius had effectively held on to his territory and remained in power for many years. Meanwhile, on the other fronts, a Moors raid consisting of two tribes called the uh, Cincincatani and Bavaris had attacked the Roman provinces in North Africa. The local Roman governor had managed to beat them back for the year, but there was still a cause for concern for the emperors. Diocletian, in the meantime, was fighting the Sarmatian tribes along the Danube, for he had given himself the title Sarmaticus Maximus for his efforts there. He continued conducting operations from Sirmium until the 11th of January, 290, when he left the city to manage his eastern provinces. At some point during his stay there, he was rudely interrupted by Saracens who were raiding Syria, so he went to the city of Emesa on May 10th before he proceeded to deal with the Saracen raiders. He must have defeated them in a quick campaign, for the Roman sources had praised his destruction of the Saracens, and he had already moved to the town of Laodicea on the 25th of May. By the 1st of July, he returned to Sirmium. It was from here that Diocletian had made plans to meet with Maximian in Milan by the end of the year, but through a very elaborate ceremony. On each side of northern Italy, cities were informed well in advance of the arrival of the two Augusti. Each city they passed by were expected to stage a large welcome for the emperors. 
Massive preparations were made, and when the time came, the two Augusti converged towards each other to Milan through the Cassian and Julian Alps with two large processions. Each city they passed by greeted them with tears, music, and images of the gods. Farmers, townsfolks, priests, magistrates, and many others flocked to see their emperors. This was a time not only for celebration, but also for opportunities, as many of them had eagerly sent their petitions to the emperors in person. A panegyric created for the occasion of Maximian's birthday a few months after this event described the scene. When you came closer and closer and people began to recognize you, all the fields were filled not only with men running forth to sea, but even the flocks of beasts leaving their distant pastures and woods. Farmers rushed about among each other and told everyone what they had seen. Altars were ignited, incense placed upon them, libations of wine were poured, sacrificial victims slain. Everything glowed with joy, everyone danced and applauded. To the immortal gods, praises and thanks were sung. They invoked not the gods transmitted by conjecture, but a visible and present Jupiter near at hand. They adored Hercules not as the stranger, but as the emperor. As they both reached the city of Milan, more people from all over the city flocked to see their emperors, who spent a good amount of resources to awe the onlookers. Both Augusti had also claimed divine patronage from their spiritual family, Diocletian's father being Jove and Maximian of Hercules, and it was through their ethereal connection to the gods that helped the empire become strong and stable. The list of victory titles they accumulated were impressive. Germanicus Maximus, Smarticus Maximus, Persicus Maximus. The crisis of the 3rd century has ended, and Rome has finally regained its dominance over its foes. The panegyric also left the scene of events outside the Roman Empire. In Africa, the Moorish tribes were at war with each other, and the Nubian tribe called the Blemis were fighting their Ethiopian neighbors. In the east, Baum II was at war with his brother Hormizd. To the north, the Goths were fighting the Vandals and Gepids. And near the Rhine, the Alemanni had lost some of their territories to the Burgundians and were fighting to regain it back. We don't know how accurate this scene is, but it seems like many of the tribes were a bit too preoccupied to bother the Romans when the Panegyric was written. Diocletian spent the next few years restructuring the Roman administration and in balancing the cities of Milan and Nicomedia with more palaces, temples, and theaters. However, there is still much more work to be done. Carousia still remains in power in Britain, for the two Augusti had made a truce with them, but they still refused to recognize them as Augustus. They did not even bother to invite him to the celebrations in Milan. After a few years of relative peace, the Moorish raiders returned to the provinces in North Africa. The Blemies were raiding Egypt and many Germanic and Sarmatian formations were gathering to invade the empire again. In the Sassanid Empire, Baram II had died and had been replaced by his son, Baram III. Both Maximian and Diocletian were also getting older and a problem of succession would soon present itself. Therefore, on the 1st of March, 293, both Diocletian and Maximian announced their own subordinate emperors that would succeed them. Gaius Galerius would be Diocletian Caesar, and Constantius would be Maximians. Thus begins the Roman Tetrarchy. <laughs>